Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Stapp. Welcome to Science for the Public. And tonight our guest is Professor Suzanne Friedberg. Suzanne Friedberg is a professor of geography at Dartmouth College, New Hampshire. This year, she's Burkhart Fellow at Radcliffe Institute for the Advanced Study uh, here in Cambridge. Dr. Friedberg received her BA in Anthropology from Yale University and her PhD in Geography from the University of California at Berkeley. Her research spans the fields of agro-food uh, studies and cultural economy and science and technology studies. Her first book, French Beans and Food Scares, Culture and Commerce in an Anxious Age, is a comparative uh, ethnography of two post-colonial fresh produce trades linking Africa and Europe. Her second book, Fresh, A Perishable History, examines uh, how the meaning of freshness in food has changed along with the technologies designed to protect it. At Radcliffe, Professor Friedberg is working on issues surrounding the sustainability of food and agriculture. Today's food market is a global one. What we eat comes from everywhere. The business of growing, processing, transporting, and storing that food has environmental consequences, the most familiar one being the carbon footprint. But big food producers and retailers, in order to present an image of responsibility to consumers, now want to measure much more than carbon. But what exactly is food's footprint, and how is it calculated, and who decides? Dr. Friedberg answers these questions for us this evening, telling us about the experts behind the green labels and what all this footprinting might mean for our food and our planet. Dr. Friedberg, welcome. Thank you. Thank okay. You. And she's going to give us a whole lot of information tonight, but could you start, please, with refreshing our memories, what is a carbon footprint? Well, the carbon footprint just refers to the it sounds like a, um, a geographic reference, but it, they're a spatial measure, but it's actually a, what I call it, a biographic measure in that it refers to the, the cradle to grave greenhouse gas emissions associated with any product, including a food product. So uh, in the case of a, the carbon footprint of a hamburger, you would need to include all the greenhouse gas emissions uh, that go into um, producing the beef, including the, uh, the, the fertilizer, including the feed, including the, the processing, the transport, um, and then in the case of the hamburger, the greenhouse gas emissions associated with frying up the burger, and then any emissions associated with, with um, disposal. Um, and if you were including the whole hamburger bun, then you would need to include <laughs> the, car, the greenhouse gas emissions associated with, make, with baking the bun and so on and so forth with the, with, for the ketchup as okay. well. So, that's so it's, a, it's a very um, comprehensive measure, at, okay. least, at least as far as greenhouse gases go. Okay, so that's the carbon footprint <laughs> yes. there. And you've gone a lot farther uh, in this respect. And so you talked, and I saw a talk recently by you about this life cycle assessment, which most of us don't know anything about. Are, can you explain what this is for us so, and how it all came about? Okay. Well, um, life cycle assessment itself is not a, a new field. I don't know if you remember, maybe back in the, the early 1990s, the, this debate about uh, diapers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the was disposable versus uh, reusable diapers. And this was a debate uh, that actually has gone on for years and years, but it was based on life cycle assessment studies. So it's similar, it's, uh, the carbon footprint is like a simplified form of, of 
life cycle assessment, or LCA as I'll call it. Um, and that it just means that you're measuring the entire cradle to grave environmental that sort of existence of a, a material good. But the difference between the carbon footprinting and doing a full LCA is that experts in LCA attempt to measure all kinds of environmental uh, impacts. So yes, greenhouse gas emissions, but they're also looking at, um, at, 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 at pollution. They're also looking at uh, water pollution. They're looking, in some cases, at the water footprint um, they're looking at ozone depletion, they're looking mm -hmm. at natural resource depletion, so kind of the whole environmental shebang. Okay. Is this fairly new, this, the LCA part? or um, Not really. I mean, the first LCA, according to the, the field's own sort of history, was, was, back when, uh, was, was conducted by Coca-Cola back in 1969, when Coca-Cola was trying, at that time, it was using all recyclable glass bottles, and it was trying to decide at the time whether it could make an environmental case for switching to another kind of uh, packaging in the case, you know, aluminum mm -hmm, or mm -hmm, plastic, mm -hmm. for example. So it isn't new, but um, f f partly because it's actually very complicated, it has only, it, it's for many years has sort of languished in obscurity with nobody paying much attention to it. And now, why are they paying attention to it, <laughs> and who? <laughs> well, it's not, I mean, it, it uh, it has a lot to do with, with um, the, the carbon footprint initially. Yeah. I mean, if you may, you may recall back in uh, 2006, 2007, this was when Al Gore's Inconvenient mm -hmm. Truth mm -hmm. came out. And, um, and then if we start to start talking just about food, this was 2007 was the year, uh, locavore was the, the word of the year. Mm -hmm. And um, so this was, this was a time when people were really starting to think about the the climate consequences of what of what we eat, um, and it's sort of been common, you know, it's sort of an easy assumption that you know, well, the farther food comes, well, farther away the food comes from, then the worse it must be for the for the climate. Mm -hmm. um, and I can actually show you some slides. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Okay, so it's okay. I'm just going to be skipping yes. through some of these. Okay. Um, this was, these are some articles from the early 2000s. Um, and these, this is actually what got me interested in the carbon footprint, was that um, some supermarkets in the UK, Tesco and Marks and Spencer, in response to British consumers' concern about climate change, um, introduced the airplane labels on all their air freight hmm. produce, much of which, if it's going into the UK, comes from, from Africa. Um, and this was fairly controversial because, um, well, for a, for a couple of reasons. One is that um, African countries have com com contributed almost nothing to climate change. They're, in general, very low carbon. Um, and secondly, this, um, the, this, the airplane label wasn't based on anything very scientific. It just was assumed that if food is flown in, it must be ba bad for the environment. Um, and Kenyan um, exporters actually responded to these airplane labels with their own campaign called Grown Under the Sun. And they, what they argued was that, well, if you look at the whole carbon footprint of our products, um, because they're grown under the sun as opposed to in greenhouses like much of the produce in, in, in Europe, at least at certain times of the year, um, it's actually overall greener than the European mm -hmm. alternatives. Mm -hmm. So this was, uh, this, this all happened back right around in 2007, and so big businesses started to think, well, really, um, in order to be, have a sort of scientific case uh, for what we sell and, and, and so forth, we really need to start measuring the, carbon, the entire carbon footprint. So here are some examples. And so, so some supermarkets started to put things directly on the labels. Mm -hmm. There were um, French supermarkets started putting things, uh, the, car the carbon emissions of your entire purchase on the, on the receipts. <laughs> there was a, the Japanese government starting, started putting carbon, um, CO2 emissions on a number of products, including beer. Um, <laughs> So this this is uh, this is what really got me me interested got in the carbon mm -hmm. footprint. Mm -hmm. um, 
But then I thought, well, what is a carbon? I started to ask myself, well, what is a carbon footprint and who's measuring it? And that's how I discovered that the real experts in this are the, 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 the people who are doing life cycle assessment. And you knew a lot, you learned a lot about these experts, right? Uh, so what is it that they do? What do they measure? How do they measure? You end up with these kinds of labels. And you have mentioned what kind of specialties they represent. Can you tell well, us they about aren't, that? I mean, we say measuring is actually not really the, the oh, right term word. because okay. they don't actually measure. They, they're, they're, they tend to be engineers. They rely on, on data. And they, so they model impacts rather than actually measuring them. Um, and they, you know, they, they sort of comb databases of all kinds all over the world, often using very sort of rough estimates, like in the, the, the biggest databases are all, are, are all European, and particularly Swiss, which, hmm. um, so you can find, so there actually isn't any data on Kenyan green beans. Um, so they hmm. have to sort of, sort of estimate using maybe data on European green beans. Um, so in many ways, as, as a geographer, as a, as a field scientist, um, to me it looks very sort of approximate. Mm -hmm. But they can, um, they can come up, they can crunch a lot of numbers and they can measure, they can estimate a lot of different things. Um, but, they tend, but they tend to come out of fields like, like environmental and chemical engineering. And what they're doing is looking basically at all the material and energy flows that go into a product's life and all the different kinds of environmental emissions that, that come out of a product's life. Right. May I ask, when you got into this, it was like another whole level, evidently. Yes. Was it very difficult to sort of penetrate this uh, data collecting. <laughs> yeah, well, I, again, I'm not, I, as a social scientist, it mm -hmm. was some, I, I actually took a course in life cycle assessment at the Harvard Extension School, and I learned the software, and I had to do my own life cycle assessment as part of the, the, the homework. Um, and then I, but then I spent a lot of time actually sort of traveling around yes. uh, to, to interview these, these, these experts to sort of learn, learn how they think. Yes. How do they think? <laughs> <laughs> do they think? Yeah, they, they think very hard. They okay, think, but right. they think it's, it's very much they sort of think in flow charts, um, yeah. and, and and it's a root. It's uh, even even the ones who who specialize in, in in agriculture, for example, they don't typically go out on they don't go onto farms, which is like a lot of my past research has been going to talk to yeah, farmers, and right. so they're 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 looking at agricultural databases rather than farms per se. Uh, agricultural databases is that like well, production? Like the food, the food, yeah, like the food right, and agriculture, right. the many, FAO. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So, it, in a sense, it's uh, what they collect is at the end of the line. It comes from somebody else. Yeah. In a sense, it's secondary, yes. not primary. You had gone out and looked at actual fields, and, and yeah. uh, you did you perceive that as very different, as uh, unsettling or anything, or it's, it's just once well, you learn it, it how is, to do it, it, you could. I mean, it, it is. Um, it raises certain questions about the, the well, the accuracy of the, the numbers they come yeah. up for, especially because um, LCA was originally kind of developed for agri for industrial products, you know, like Coke bottles or something. Yeah. And for, mo for most of the sort of field's history, that's they've measured industrial products. But when you're talking about agricultural products, you're talking about things that, that are produced under immensely varied conditions, right. much more varied than, a, than factories, you know, so that you may see quite a bit of variation in the soil and, and greenhouse gas emissions and so just from one field to the next. Right. Um, just as an aside, when I think of that, uh, this is a huge scale, for example, and as you say, there are these tremendous variables right there uh, when you're looking at agricultural data. The temperatures one year, the, the, the weather, uh, mm -hmm. all of these things factor into the availability of water, relative availability of water, and, and so on. Um, do they adjust for this, or did you find mm -hmm. that straightforward, no problem? Well, that you, you can, but the mm -hmm. thing is is that um, doing, a, doing an LCA, a full life cycle assessment of a product, is actually uh, 
to do it well is 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 very time consuming and can be very right. expensive. It can take um, you know if a, cons a sort of an expert consultancy is doing it can take several weeks to several months, tens of thousands of dollars to to do a single product. Right. Um, who pays for such a thing? <laughs> who uses that? Right. Um, I mean, is it going to show up in my mailbox or anything like no, that? No, 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 no. <laughs> no. I mean, this is this is an important reason why, for so many years, it, it didn't get a lot of airplay. No. <laughs> and it, it wasn't being. I mean, it was again. It was more. Uh, there was there are more companies, more um, more governments are paying attention to life cycle assessments in northern Europe than uh -huh. in the U.S. But. Um, but but these days, increasingly, it, they it's major retailers and manufacturers, and even um, even since two thousand and seven, when I st started paying attention to the carbon footprint, more and more companies have have come around and said, well, actually, we need to measure more than carbon. We need to measure as many things as possible in order to show that we are uh, sustainable. You know, concerned about sustainability. So um, the biggest example mm -hmm. of a um, oh, this is a yes this is this is a, a flow chart of, <laughs> of, a, of a ketchup LCA. Oh, um, this is just the ketchup. Yeah, okay. that's just the ketchup. Um, so the the biggest uh, patron of life cycle assessment these days is is Walmart, um, which uh, back in two thousand and nine, as part of its what's become known of its its, its green revolution announced that it was going to create this vast sort of uh, sustainable product index in which all the products on its shelf would be um, sort of ranked according to the um, according to sort of the things that life cycle assessment measures so carbon footprint water footprint uh, natural resources and so forth um, and in 2009 when it made this announcement it it, it, it Implied that all this information was going to be provided to consumers. It was going to show up in a single, you know, sort of easy to read format for consumers. Um, it's now not so clear that that's that that's going to happen. Um, but in order to build this index, it, Walmart emphasized that it couldn't do this alone because it was going to need data from its suppliers. And there's mm -hmm. some sixty thousand suppliers mm -hmm. in the world of, for Walmart, and so. And partly in order to do this, it formed uh, what's called the Sustainability Consortium, which is a consortium that's it's technically a research initiative. It's based at the University of Arkansas, um, but it's funded entirely by corporate sponsor, corporate membership fees, which run up to $250,000 a year. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just for food, but there are a lot of food companies involved, which range from or food related anyway. So you've got Coke and, and McDonald's, you've got Kellogg's, you've got Mars, you've got Monsanto, as mm -hmm. well as some of the other agrochemical companies. And all these, these com and you've also got a handful of large NGOs like World Wildlife Fund, um, the um, Environmental Defense Fund. And so all these organizations are supposedly committed to this larger project of, of doing life cycle assessment on all kinds of products and using this information both to inform consumers, perhaps, but also in their own decisions of, of how to make things and what to put on their shelves. Do you have any sense of how that actually um, determines what shows up on their cell sh shelves? In, uh, like. Has it had any change? Have you seen any change? <laughs> there is so far. There's no evidence that his, and, and partly, par, partly the the problem is that in fact they haven't figured out how to basically speed up everything. So the first two years of the sustainability consortium's existence, despite the fact that they would have recruited some of the top LCA experts in the world, all of whom I interviewed. It, in the first two years, they finished uh, studies of seven products. <laughs> ah, <laughs> right. So, so the, you know, things, you know, things like wheats, you know, Wheaties and 
yogurt, yeah. and not not uh, not you know not laptop computers or something. Exactly, fairly. exactly. So, and the other part of this that interests me at least is that these are for the most part very large corporations. They're not Ben and Jerry's or something like that. Is that the consortium difficult to get into? for companies that maybe really have a commitment, uh, but they can't get their names on this. Is that is that a possibility? I Yes, okay. yes. I mean, I, right. there are, there are. I think uh, uh, Stonyfield is on there, so okay. Stonyfield, but, but again, you have, it's paying. It's right. paying. And I think it's a it's, lot of money. Yes. Okay, yes. where does this money go? It goes to the experts or? Um, yeah, well, it's going supposedly into into research, but that's there's actually I mean, the, quite a yeah. bare bones staff at, at on that's doing that at the University of Arkansas. So, um, and uh, it, that's a good question of exactly where all the the, the money is going. It's yeah, not the that's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a bit ironic because the the whole project is supposedly devoted to transparency. You know, generating all this information that. Is going to help companies Seven and products. Consumers. Yeah, but it is. Uh, it isn't. Yeah. It hasn't been the easiest organization to to find out about. Okay, so one of the difficulties we have two things. Then most of us don't really know a lot about what's involved in that LCA. And I promise you, if you look, say Wikipedia or something mm -hmm. like that, it is really obscure. The, the you can't <laughs> understand what this thing is. So one of my questions for you was like, what are the measures? <laughs> you know, but I can I can appreciate that must be um, a really uh, difficult thing. The other thing is, how does this affect the products at the end of the line? Let's say that we have something that is uh, that makes an, an enormous carbon footprint. Does this? Could that be one of those seven products that somebody might say, well, let's do something about it. Does anything happen necessarily as a result? Would this be a good time to show the... Yes. Okay. So um, I have a Walmart video. It's called The Secret Life of Sliced Turkey. Hidden behind the labels of the products on our shelves lies a vast system of companies, each of which has ingeniously evolved its industry to grow, manufacture, and deliver the products of our lives. The raw truth is that the design of this system is unsustainable. We are running out of the resources we depend upon to survive and thrive. This reality presents an unprecedented opportunity an opportunity that can only be seen when we step out of our individual roles and view the system as a whole. Join us as we explore the secret life of sliced turkey. A lot of people think that the turkey they eat starts at the farm, gets processed, and is delivered to the store. That's really just the tip of the iceberg. The whole story involves much, much more. From an ingredients point of view, this one product is comprised of many products. Each ingredient, from salt to sweetener to the zipper on the package, is a separate, distinct product. And each one of these products has a life of its own. So we tracked each one of these products back through the system, from our supplier to their suppliers to their suppliers. And because each dot on this map represents a factory or facility that uses resources, we began partnering with those suppliers to get information about energy use and water use. For this pound of turkey, we are finding that the processing of the turkey itself consumes the highest amount of water. Farbest, the processor, went to work on innovating their water use in their facility. They discovered a way to process more turkey while using nearly 50 million less gallons of water a year. In terms of energy use, we can also see that the manufacturing of the sliced turkey product has the highest costs. In just two years of viewing their business through the lens of sustainability, Plum Rose's new trucks are up to 30% more efficient and they found ways to deliver more product while driving 800,000 less miles doing it. That's 300 less coast-to-coast -coast hauls a year. Rethinking distribution led to redesigning packaging. Today they're selling more turkey but using 35% less cardboard and by converting to reusable crates and pallets, 
They're leaving more trees in the forest and conserving water for millions of families in the surrounding communities. In total, these innovations are saving Plum Rose nearly a million dollars a year. Seeing our business and our products in this way is a real game changer. It's helping us grow our partnership with Walmart, it's showing us who the real leaders are in the industry and our supply chain, and it's helping us reduce cost. And perhaps more importantly, it's helping us make connections all the way back to the farm, where we know a lot of innovation opportunities exist. Partnership is very important, otherwise we're just an island, and we need to be more than that. I mean, we need to be connected. And when we get more and more cooperation from our suppliers and their suppliers, there's no telling where we're going to go. In the end, all this effort is about the customer in the store. It's about saving her money and making every dollar she spends a vote for a better world. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> that was impressive in the sense of uh, this was very well motivated, that in fact there were some significant changes in costs and, and stuff. You still get that horrible process turkey at the end, <laughs> and they're still living under those conditions. But in any case, the, it sounds as though putting all this, once you figure out the rubrics, how to do this uh, mm -hmm. properly, you could save resources and money and all sorts of things. You worked your way through this. Did you feel that that was the case, and or is it sporadic, or? Well, I mean, the, the, the one reason why it's important that this is a Walmart video is because Walmart, I mean, this is, this, um, this, this goes well beyond, this is not greenwashing. Walmart has the clout to make, yes. uh, to make many big companies change their ways. Yes. And Walmart does have an interest in any kind of, sort of eco efficiency that's going to save money. So reducing water use, reducing energy use, reducing cardboard boxes or something that that's all that's all good, right? right, in, in right. For, good for Walmart and in general, sort of good for the environment. But um, it also, I mean, it, it's a, it can be very seductive, these sorts of right. things. It's meant to be. Yes, yes. <laughs> and it, um, it doesn't, you know, there are, this is the, what was focused on here was not actually a, a, sort of what, a complete life cycle assessment. It wasn't looking at, you know, toxicity, yeah. um, you know, what, what might have been the pollution ca caused by the, the t turkey farm, for right. example. Right, yeah. Um, so there are things that, that it, it, uh, the guy starts off by saying, well, this is not, you know, the whole story. Now we're going to tell you the whole story. Yeah. It's still not the whole story. Right, right. right. I understand that. And it, it, that the whole story is just gigantic, especially, especially when you think about the, uh, all the pieces that go into any kind of a product, that piece of turkey and, and right. stuff. That's understandable. I, under, I understand that. Um, can we live without an LCA uh, at this point, do you think? <laughs> uh, it sounds uh, to me that as though companies need it, that it, it really can add up to a savings somehow. It's a, uh, that factor I understand. In terms of quality of product, I'm asking, do you think we can do without the LCA or do we need it more, do you think? Well, I think that, uh, I, I mean, the, the general idea, the broader approach of life cycle thinking, this is what the, the, the LCA experts talk about, is life cycle thinking is, is valuable. And it's yeah. something that, you know, even as a, as a geography professor, and, and I, I encourage my students to think about where things come right, from, sure. how, who else has handled them. And so th that's hard to, it's hard to argue with that, that big picture perspective. Um, but uh, I think that a lot of attention goes towards the, the um, towards these claims about well we've got the whole story and now this means we are doing a, a really good job that we are now a green company <laughs> yes, and so forth right and you're not maybe it's, that's not always too persuasive well, or again, something but and it could be in a process yeah right, in process. What does it mean for a consumer? Does it, I mean, at the end of the day, and I'm of course pushing toward your superb article that I wanted to ask people to be sure to see in the HuffPost thing, but the, at the end of the day, 
what does it do for consumers? Does it help us? Can we understand what they put on the back of these packages? Because it's incomplete in various ways. What's our, what do we get out of this? Well, um, how much it, sort of information on the package we will get is, is, is sort of less and less clear. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mentioned that back in 2009, Walmart had said this was all going to go was going to be for the consumer. Um, but anytime you put something that's what they you know, on a label or what they call consumer facing information, then it has to be pretty uh, precise. You have to worry about, because because then consumers can start saying, well, should I buy this turkey yes, or that turkey? Right. And then can, you know, companies can, you know, can argue with each other. And this, I mean, this was the problem with the diapers long ago, was that they were arguing about each other's numbers. Um, and this is why it took them two years to do those seven products. Mm -hmm. um, and so companies, since even just over the past couple of years, if you sort of read the, the trade press, there seems to be a sort of, a, rethinking in the world of corporate food. It's like, well, maybe, especially given that we already know that maybe 5% of consumers are actually paying attention to uh. green labeling anyway. And I'm talking, you know, organic is one thing, but organic tends to be something we pay attention to for health reasons mm -hmm. as opposed to environmental mm -hmm. reasons. But the, 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 the percentage of consumers who are really paying close attention to, to green labeling is very, very small. So therefore, con con companies are thinking, well, is it really worth <laughs> all this time and effort? And wouldn't it be just more useful? Wouldn't we get sort of more bang for our buck, buck if we just focus on um, they call sort of B2B, business to business mm -hmm, communication. Mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. we don't have to worry about being quite so precise. So what seems to be happening now in, inside the con sustainability consortium is that they are not worrying so much about uh, precision and they're just um, the researchers there, again, as far as I've been able to tell, have been just like, focusing on getting sort of a rough idea, like in the case of the, the banana, what are all the kind, different kinds of environmental impacts that we should be worried about for bananas? So that when Walmart sits down with its banana suppliers, it can ask them, so what have you been doing about water? What have you been doing yeah. about pesticides, greenhouse gas emissions, and so forth? Um, and that, and so then Walmart can sort of <laughs> get Dole or Chiquita or whoever to, to, to change, to make changes. Um, but none of that information is necessarily going to show up in a number in the, in, on the shelf. Right. How about accessibility to that information, though, if you are one of that tiny percent? And it, then I want to ask why people are not engaged in it do they why is it that they don't know <laughs> this stuff do you is it a case of maybe I should start there is it a case that they don't know because you don't know that that information is out there do you see what I mean or do, are they disengaged well I mean I think I mean the, to answer the, the first question first I mean I think I think um, I don't see a lot of evidence that it will be accessible, that, that you will be able to find out exactly how Walmart decides w which bananas go are greener than others. Um, and that's, you know, that's one of the, the, the troubling things about mm -hmm. it is that uh, it's the sustainability consortium that's going to decide what, it, what questions get asked of, of suppliers. Um, but in terms of why don't consumers pay attention, I mean, that's a, I mean, we're busy, you know. <laughs> True, but you mentioned uh, just shortly ago that in Northern Europe, for example, people pay attention to, to a lot of this stuff. In pockets in this country, people pay more attention. When that whole locavore thing started, wherever that might lead, it was like people are waking up to this. So there may be a curiosity, but you don't know what to look for, right? Yeah. Right. It's like that label, it says it's organic, it must be, yeah. right? Uh, so it, 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 the, the, the question then is, well, if the information is available to, these, to the consortium 
and they're rather slow getting it together, but that may be just a process thing, just something that for the time being. But people might want to know, they don't want to read four volumes, mm -hmm. but they might want to know. And so do you, are you optimistic? Do you think people will be more well, the big test case right now is France. Yes. Which I uh, would you tell us about? Yeah. That, so, please? and this is again something something has gotten remarkably little uh, yes. press coverage in the U.S. <laughs> yes. But the same year that Walmart, within a month of Walmart announcing its index back in 2009, France passed a law saying, and it was the first country in the world to do so, saying consumers had the right to comp complete, mm -hmm. accurate, and detailed environmental information about their. Um, about their products their, and their food in particular. Um, and they, they passed this law without, quite, without realizing quite how complicated this was going to be to, to put into place. Um, so it took them, again, it took them about two years to sort of come up with the guidelines for companies. Right now it's in a trial period, mm -hmm. and this is the launch of the trial period back in, in October. So there's 160 some companies that um, are involved in producing this information, and it's called, they're, they're referring to it as eco-labeling, but a lot of the information is actually just going on companies' websites, so they have, mm -hmm, some of them mm -hmm, have developed, mm -hmm. like, some, you know, um, pages you can access versus your, your smartphone. Um, and these are some examples of the, the labels. The, the interesting thing is that right, right now, and this, if it becomes a mandatory and universal, they'll have to, to change this, but right now companies are, they're all you doing different kinds of labels. Yes. So some have numbers, some have sort of spectrum, some have letter grades. And here you, you have examples of wine and you know, eclairs and uh, smoked trout and all kinds of nice things. Um, but you can't, but because all the companies have done it differently, you can't yeah. actually, cons French consumers can't actually compare. Uh, but this trial is supposed to go on for a year, and then the government is going to do all kinds of surveys and research to find out can consumers, well, first, can, can they even figure it out? Yes. Can they, does this, you know, uh, water footprint, does that make any sense to them? Mm -hmm. Does eutrophication, mm -hmm. some of them are measuring water eutrophication, <laughs> can they get that? Um, and then two, if they can get it, are they doing, are they actually, buying any differently. Yes, and that takes time, I guess, to assess that yes. sort of thing. But there's, so there's one country out there that at least makes an effort, and I can, you can appreciate that the whole thing takes time while people figure out what is the best thing. In your mind, are the French consumers interested in that sort of thing, or does it just put them to sleep? Well, my, my anecdotal research going into, I was there in October, and I went into some stores, and. Um, interviewed some shoppers, and they were, they, most of them had not noticed it yet. Oh, I mean, right. And, okay. and then, you know, and <laughs> people that I talked to at greater length would say, well, this is all very nice, but I buy for taste, you know. Mm -hmm. so, you know and then, and, um, so uh, the, the French government sees this as kind of a long-term, like yeah. a generational project, that it may take 20 years before consumers sort of understand, you know, sort of think about the carbon footprint the way they might think about calories or something, yes. not the French right. think about calories that much, but, um, uh, but, but it is, I mean, if the government decides to, to go forward with it and make it mandatory, um, the EU is watching this, Japan and South Korea mm -hmm. have also mm -hmm. indicated mm -hmm. they're looking at the France example, and it could become, I mean, this, if it becomes mandatory, it will apply to all products sold in France, so it actually has big implications for for international trade and for U.S. companies, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it's not a it's not a, it's not a trivial thing, but a lot depends on how consumers react to it. And consumers need to know something, and probably are interested in some part of this, and maybe will become more interested um, in the future. But you wrote a wonderful article about this, and uh, so I want to make sure that people know about it, and it, you can just click on it in the um, on our website. But can you please tell us about that? Uh, because you're talking about going beyond, in that case, I think it was going beyond Food, Inc., if you've seen that uh, film. Could you give us a little? Yeah, well, this was a, it was a, a, an op-ed that I wrote in response to Food, Inc., which I think also came out in 2009. Um, and 
I, I was uh, I was a little bit incensed afterwards because um, on one hand it was it's a it's a movie that shows all kinds of you know, major problems in the in the, the food system structural problems mm -hmm. uh, problems of, of power inequalities of lack of transparency of you know, power you know um, lobbies on, that are influencing government policy and so forth and then uh, and then the the, the, the the, the movie part ends and the, the, the credits start to roll and says, well, you can, you know, but you can do something, you can change the world, you know, with, three, with every bite or something. And the op-ed that I wrote was called, you know, Vote Now, Eat Later mm -hmm. or something, it, it too, because I think that, um, I, I think that what we, we can't change the world with every bite, and we can't the, 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 the most important changes are not going to happen solely through our, 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 our market purchases. Mm -hmm. um, and you know I'm a, as a loyal a farmer's market shopper as, as the next person, but um, I don't think that um, just buying the right thing is enough to, is, is enough to, for example, uh, to get rid of the agribusiness lobby that's responsible for a lot of the like the problems in the U.S. food system, for example. Okay, so we because you're stuck with buying a lot of that the the foods, or you may not know, or not everybody would know. But you made such an excellent point in there. I happen to see Food Inc. twice myself, <laughs> but I so but it's very interesting to hear your excellent analysis there. That that's not enough. You know, just what you eat or don't eat is not solving a larger problem and so what does solve the large, larger problem? Well the problem is that there. the larger problems take uh, harder work and more frustrating work, right? Um, yeah, I think you know we have to remember that we're not just consumers but we're also citizens. Right. Okay. And so in the US you know one of the big projects and there are now lots of groups working on this is 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 reforming the farm bill. Mm -hmm. um, so that that Subsidies are not going to these major commodity producers, um, so that um, so there are food supplies, and and, and I, I don't want the, the the farm bill is not going to, would not solve everything, right. but it would. Right. Um, I think that the, the the farm bill is kind of a, an, an artifact of the sort of the huge power inequalities that are, that in in the U.S. food system, okay. and. A food system that's really dominated by the interests of major corporations. Okay. Um, not even, you know, not. The, we talk about the, the subsidies going to farmers. The farmers are in general not the main beneficiaries. Right. It's the Corporate. corporations. Exactly. Uh, do you know is if that situation obtains in other very developed countries yes. as well? The same <laughs> thing. Well, uh, basically. It's very similar. I mean, like yeah. you know, we we romanticize the French exactly system, or but, the but Swiss but or something like that, but it's not really what's going on. Is that it? That yeah. So this is a this, this is, is a not problem. it's not a uniquely U.S. problem. It's just simply, but because the U.S. is is big and ha is a, is a, a major uh, agricultural producer, the 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 scale. Of, I mean, the, the 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 problem with the U.S. food system is it doesn't just the harms are not just to us as U.S. consumers, but it, they're global. We because yeah. we produce so much <laughs> surplus, we end up. Dumping a lot of it on, you know, in poor countries. Unsuspecting <laughs> yes, yeah. nations. Yes. Right, yeah. Right. But it also has produced a great deal of waste, and I was just wondering if that uh, that is the the, uh, the the stuff that is not the perfect tomato gets chucked or, or something like this. The the this uh, very different approach to what counts as perfect and so on and you get a lot of stuff just chucked out uh, and so that I don't know if that factors into this uh, uh, assessment at all too but it is huge but your point I think was that well citizens have to wake up you have to be a citizen not just getting out your selected munchies there but uh, yeah. to actually act as a, as a citizen do you have any other good points for us, the advice for us that you'd like to <laughs> add or anything else that you'd like to show before I let people uh, ask questions uh, there? I guess I would say not to, be, be, not to agonize too much about every purchase. I mean, I, 
that in terms of you know how to minimize your own uh, envir the environmental footprint of your own diet a lot of the things are we've known since the 1970s mm -hmm. you know about mm -hmm. eating lower on the food chain and you know I mean not eating things out of their greenhouse grown in the winter time and so forth so um, but beyond that I would say that uh, that that because your purchase is not going to, to change the world right. that it's not worth it's not worth a too much mental energy, I would right. say, and it, um, it's better to, to to devote that to other kinds of work. Right, and then maybe it takes more of a collective approach, yeah. like the consortium, something that is the <laughs> counterbalance. Counter. That. Right, okay. Dr. Friedberg, thank you so very much, and I need to let the good people ask you questions okay. at this time. And uh, so first, thank you very thank much. You. And, thank and you. then I'll turn it over to our audience. Since the sound will not pick up well from the floor, if people to ask as clearly as you can, and would you mind repeating it? I will try to write it down as well as I can, too. Okay. Okay, thank you, please. Oh, that's um, influenced you. <laughs> your, uh, groundbreaking book, Diet for a Small Planet. What was that in the 1970s? Yeah. Yes, it was. About yeah. the impact of animal-based <laughs> diets versus plant-based diets, and just um, to me, she seemed like such a, a visionary, and that message still seems to be as relevant, if not more, than ever before. So I was just wondering if she influenced you at all. Yeah, I. I uh, <laughs> it's funny you should ask that because. <laughs> Well, uh, quite. I mean, probably my life would have been very different if I my I read uh, my mother's copy when I was a teenager. Um, I decided on the basis of that to become a vegetarian, and have been so ever since. But then I also, uh, <laughs> but I, I'm not a proselytizer; just that happens to be. Um, but then after college, I uh, I went to work for her actually as a volunteer, which she was then living in. Um, in, San, in San Francisco, at the, and that was when she was at Food First. So Food First was my first, it was actually a volunteer job after college, and, and it was from there that I discovered the, the geography department at Berkeley, where they do a lot of research on you know, food and agriculture. And um, So actually, yes, it was pivotal, and I, was, I saw her, uh, I was on a panel with the Boston Book Festival with her last fall, which was, although we, we hadn't seen each other for years and years. But. Like your mother had a good book collection. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> the right thing, and she is right here. So that and has just come out with something new, or her daughter yeah, that's, has. That's, yeah, that's the, why the we the new the new book. That's wonderful. We're glad yeah. to know. Please. Yes. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first, I imagine the um, LCA is the result is essentially a lot of quantitative quantitative mm -hmm. data about the uh, impacts of the product. Yeah, so the question is like, how can you use LCA to actually create a, an index? Uh, and that's one, that's one thing that they're trying to figure out at the consortium, because one, one problem is that often products that are good in one, that score well in one sense may not score well in another. So for example, uh, many life cycle assessments of, of organic products, um, they will, they will look very good on the very low toxicity, right, because they're not using uh, synthetic pesticides, but they tend to have a higher carbon footprint because they, you need more land for the same amount of yield. Um, so that's uh, how do you weight these things. That be, that's, again, it's a, it's a political issue. And it's not, if you're just doing sort of individual studies, a company internally, it doesn't really matter. But if you're trying to create this vast index for all products, then, it, then it's much trickier. <laughs> okay, yes, go ahead. I'm going to show my ignorance, but that, that's not That's all right. No, <laughs> at the very end, um, you know, two of the just sort of throwaway things that people, sh you know, obviously grown out of that. Yeah, they don't, there is no labeling for the greenhouse. Uh, I mean, sometimes you can sort of surmise. Like, so for example, in, uh, yeah, I don't know if you've, for example, one uh, Shaw's carries this brand of uh, 
called Backyard Tomatoes. I don't know if you've ever you've seen these recently. Back in, it's called, they're called Backyard Tomatoes in the little subtitles grown not too far from here. <laughs> and so the back, Backyard Tomatoes is, is a company based in, in Maine. And I think that their greenhouses are the biggest structure, built structures in the entire state of Maine. They're fairly new. There was a New York Times article on this like, last year or something. Um, so if you're seeing those tomatoes in, in January, they're actually pretty tasty. <laughs> I, I've tried them, as I, as I said, but uh, that it's fair to, to fair bet that that they're, they've come out of a greenhouse. And so that is, like in terms of the LCA, that is worse than buying a tomato from a foreign place that's, you know, flown in? Or it probably, if it's a tomato, it would probably be trucked. trucked. So in, in the winter, I mean, again, these aren't necessarily going to be very tasty tomatoes, but, uh, and I usually forego them in the winter, but yeah. um, in the winter, you would probably be better, uh, get a smaller carbon footprint of getting a tomato that had been trucked from Florida than one from Maine. Gotcha. <laughs> from Maine, it's, okay, yeah. especially. Eddie? This is not a question, but I think the local uh, produce place has the best local producer over mm. Watertown mm -hmm. because they, they give a storage for almost everything they sell uh, somewhere on the car. Yeah, they're, they're, so they're they're just yeah, some stores, you mentioned Russo's in, in, in Watertown, some stores are, are better than others, but they, they still won't necessarily tell you if it's a whether it's field greenhouse field, grown yeah. or field, you know. That's, that's true. I mean, by, uh, by law now, this is that, and this has been the case for a few years, supermarkets are supposed to put at least country of origin on all products. But um, the, I, don't, I, think that I don't think that law is enforced very carefully. <laughs> okay. One more, and then we'll stop, but then you can keep talking to us. This is the cynic in me, maybe. But um, as long as these uh, LCA analyses are being funded by the long list of corporations on your screen, is there any likelihood at all that the results will be used to make the kind of choices between products or between types of foods as opposed to just making the product this company's already making a little more efficient? Well, in, in, if, if, so the question is: Would uh, is there if, if LCAs are being funded by major multinationals, are there is there ever going to be any chance to to make cha the kind of changes beyond what's profitable for Walmart and so forth? And again, I would say that uh, France may be the test case because this is supposed to be uh, you know a public decision. And in besides. Uh, Besides the government surveys and so forth, I think they'll they'll be seeking public input. Um, but uh, I I I don't see the, the the corporations coming up with any measures of Im improvement that would not benefit their bottom line. <laughs> it, it reminds me of when you know I'm in the supermarket. I, I remember once spending five minutes deciding which bag of potato chips was left bad for me than the other. <laughs> Yeah. I obviously shouldn't have been buying potato chips. <laughs> <laughs> naughty, naughty, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People, uh, we have to stop there for recording purposes. Please, uh, as soon as we stop, then you can continue your questions if you would like and come and talk to Dr. Friedberg. Dr. Friedberg, thank you very thank you, much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>